Hello, everyone. My name is Chiu Ki Chen, and today I'm here to bust the Android fragmentation myth. Yes, really catchy title. Um, you'll probably hear because you've heard that Android has many, many devices and super difficult to develop on. And I'm hoping that by the end of this talk, you will come home with some techniques to not only deal with that, but embrace the idea that there are many devices out there and it's a good thing. Um, before I get started, just want to get a sense of your experience in the development world. So um, how many of you are mobile developers, either Android, iOS? Wow, okay, so maybe you already know a lot of this stuff. Um, how many of you are web developers? Okay, even more hands. Good, because this talk draws very, very heavily on web technologies, on techniques that we are already doing in HTML, in JavaScript, and CSS. Um, in particular, if you look at this, and I'm trying to play the video. Okay, I'll just let go. All right. Um, there's this thing called a web browser, and it's that's pretty much infinitely sized, right? You can drag it to whatever dimension, whatever ratio you want. And it's not the end of the world. We deal. We have been making web pages for a long, long time. And using the same techniques that we have been doing for web development, you can make Android apps just as responsive and also progressive, meaning that it will take advantage of the features that are available on that particular device, but you know, will not crash and burn when you are running on an older device. I'm going to very quickly run you through Hello World in Android so that you have a good idea of how the program is structured. Hello World, uh, very boring, is just a screen that says the word Hello World. Well, how do you write that in Android? We have this thing called an activity, and if you're familiar with web development, this is almost like your JavaScript, it's where the logic goes. And within your activity, you will set the content view, meaning that you are setting the Presentation layer, essentially your HTML. And the way it works is that you put this XML in the layout folder, which will get then compiled into something that Android understands. This XML looks not too scary, I hope. The idea is that, for example, we are calling text view, meaning that we want to display text. And then you see things like the width and the height are wrapped content. Um, this is Android ways of saying, just take as much space as you need, right? Instead of saying that this is going to be 100 pixels wide. The interesting thing here I want to point out is also there are attributes like ID, which again, if you're familiar with web development, it's just like an ID you put on a DOM node, which you can then do a find view by ID on your activity, and then you can have a pointer to it, and then you can set value to it. All right, so that's. Android in the whirlwind, right? So the idea is that there is a presentation and then the logic. So what makes it possible to do Android on so many devices is that it's actually a declarative layout system. So now, something that's slightly different from our Hello World, here we have a button that's in the middle of the screen, right? So if someone gave you this as a task and asked you to implement it, if you come from some other platforms or some other disciplines, you may be tempted to say, aha, all right, I have a button, and I'm going to put it in this x, y coordinate on screen, and that's how I'm going to lay out the button. And some of these are smiling. What happens when you say, oh, rotate the screen? Then if you have an absolute coordinate like that, well, it will stay very faithfully at that position and look really weird. Instead, what you want is put it in the center of the screen. And this is what I mean by declarative layout. In Android, it's in the system. All you need to do is just tell Android that, hey, I want to assign a gravity value of center. Center is a short form for um, center horizontal and center vertical. So Android will, depending on how large of the screen, compute x, y coordinate for you and put it in the center of the screen. So far, so good. Nothing rocket science, right? You just have to think like that instead of, some, some of the, um, I, I guess, developers come from a world where they take mocks, right, with absolute coordinate, and then they just stick things on. And th they will be very confused when they come to Android and say, well, I can't do that. How do I ever lay out things on screen? But if you turn the head around and think declaratively, it's not that bad. So now something slightly more complicated. Say you're building this game that want to find the difference between two images. And what you want to do is actually split the screen equally. 
so that you have as much real estate as possible for your two images. And by the way, can you actually spot the difference? Little break. Nobody? Can you see the, I think I will play with my laser pointer. There's a little difference here. So um, anyway, that is not the point of this slide. The slide is to show you the layout and how are we going to achieve that? So now we have a new element that's called linear layout. What linear layout does is allow you to lay things out linearly. Um, in our case, we're doing it vertically, just as I showed you on the screenshot, one after another. And the curious thing is that now what we're doing in the layout, instead of saying wrap content that I did earlier, what it does is for the width, it says match parent, which means just take as much width as there is given to me by the parent, which is the linear layout, which say the same thing again, so it's going to fill up the full screen. Now the height, we are saying zero. You're like, what? Take zero height? What this means is that I'm telling Android, well, you know, at the time I'm writing this layout, I don't know how big it is, but I'm gonna give you some more information. I'm gonna give you weight. So I'm telling Android that give weight one to the first image, and also one to the second image. And Android is going to go ahead and say, okay, we have a total of two, and then divide equally. So that layout actually is still have something missing. So I have the two images, right, that I specified in my linear layout. Can someone spot something on this screen that I have not spelled out on the previous slide, on the XML? Bit of a trick question here. So that's image one, and then there's image two. And I have a divider in the middle. So how am I gonna do that? So here I'm actually telling Android that, well, for the divider, I'm going to give you a specific dimension. I want it to be one DP. And then it's going to assign this much real estate to the divider, and the rest of the screen is gonna divide using the weight. One DP, what is DP? DP stands for density independent pixel, and it's a very important concept in Android, which is why it's so big on the screen. Um, so I, I'm sure you have heard of retina and things of that kind, right? Like, so mobile devices are not all of the same density on the display, and this is how Android deals with that. So instead of designing things to pixel values, what you need to do is think in terms of DPs, meaning that, say, I want something that's this wide on screen, right? But if you have a device that is double density, then it will automatically shrunk into half size if you are doing it in pixel value. So this is a convenient way to say, well, I want it to be 100 dp, and then if you are on a double density device, it will multiply that into 200 pixels. Um, again, not rocket science, but just things that the system already built in, anticipating that there will be a lot of different kinds of devices out there. Right, so now we have two images and we have a divider. Great. Again, what happens when I rotate the device? So if I use the same layout which I spelled out earlier that divides the height equally, then we'll get this, which is this teeny tiny little robot, which is not very good for spotting the difference. What we actually want is this. I want to instead divide the screen horizontally. I want to split up the width. How do you do that? Well, the layout is relatively straightforward. Instead of splitting the uh, height, I'm splitting width using the weight, and then I'm switching the linear layout to use horizontal. But the interesting part on this slide is actually the title. So I, earlier I showed you that I put the XML file into this folder called the layout, and you can also put it in a different folder, say layout-land, it means that if I detected that the device is of landscape orientation, Android is going to go ahead and load this layout instead of the normal layout, the default layout from the layout folder. And the nice thing about this is if any of you do Rails development, it's kind of the same idea, like you're using the structure of your program to tell the system what it needs to do. And if you notice that I have also here things like ID, which matches whatever I have in the earlier slide. So the logic doesn't need to change, right? If the logic is say, oh, I want to load this particular image and put it in image one, depending on the layout of the screen, it's just going to find the correct image view and stick it in. Um, so this is just to show you 
how you're going to actually put that into your system. So you put it in a different folder with the same name, and you are still calling this r.layout.activity underscore main, which is Android way of compiling all these resources, that's what R stands for, from the folders, and then well, I have this one identifier that says I want activity main as the layout, and then at runtime the system will know that, oh, the device is rotated, it's on landscape orientation, I'm gonna go ahead and use the proper layout file. So this is a brief introduction to layout folders, the normal one and then the landscape one. There's actually a lot more you can do with layout folders. This is not even the complete list, I'm just giving you a flavor of what's there. I've showed you earlier the layout land, and I'm putting it into the uh, layout folder with an XML. You can also do other things like drawable. Drawable is essentially PNG most of the time, but there are also other kinds of drawables. And here, what I'm doing is saying that if I am of a high density uh, device, use this image for the launcher, which is what you see on the home screen. Um, this way you can have a much more finer grained icon for devices that have the pixels to display them, but still, you know, for low density uh, devices, you can put something in the LDPI folder that not only, it's not just you take an image and you scale it down, like you are actually able to, for example, change a little bit of the design so that it looks better when you have not as much pixel to express yourself. Now, you can also combine these variables. So I can say that I want a drawable uh, that get loaded when I have a large screen and of landscape orientation, which is what I'm doing here with my app. Uh, this is an app that teaches people how to write Chinese, so I have this beautiful background, which I'm not sure if you can see on screen. There's a very subtle bamboo forest behind the monkey. Okay, you have, just have to believe me. Well, anyway, <laughs> monkeys don't live in bamboo forests, right? Um, but my designer said, yeah, it makes it look Chinese, so let's just put some bamboo on, but you can't even see it anyway. Um, so the idea is that when I have the real estate on screen, I want to give the experience of having this nice background. But when I'm on a small screen, I actually, again, you have to trust my word on this. Now it does not have any bamboo on the background. What it has is a gradient. So when I'm on a phone, I actually don't really want to bother with all those extra declarative elements because it's a little bit distracting. So in Android, it actually makes it fairly easy for you to do. All you have to do is you put the proper drawable in the proper folder and then it will get determined for you. And something that is a little bit different besides the folder name is that I'm calling this splash.xml and instead of splash.png, what is a XML drawable? Here, I'm actually, again, declarative, right? I'm declaring that I want the background to be a rectangle with a gradient of this start color and this end color, which if you read RGB very fluently, it'll be from some shade of green to some other shade of green. Uh, and then what Android does is then it will take the value from start to end and then do all the math and extrapolate for you. So if you have a small screen, fine, it will fill it up. If you have a bigger screen, it will still fill up with the same start and end color, but with a very smooth gradient, right? Because if you imagine you're generating this gradient in Photoshop, say, right, you can only give that gradient so many pixel values. At some point, there will be banding, right? It will just have to repeat some of the um, color because you gave it this much to put on screen and then the screen actually ended up being this big. So having a declarative drawable means that you can adapt to any screen size you want, essentially, by just computing the value on the fly. So if you want something a little bit more complicated instead of just a straight up gradient, say a pattern. So somehow you have this app that talks about bees and you want to put in this nice honeycomb background which if you just naively put in a wallpaper essentially of a fixed expat ratio, and then you use the exact same thing on a horizontal aspect ratio, then you get corn on the cob instead of the honeycomb, which doesn't seem very well. So how are we going to deal with that? Well, there's this technique called tau backgrounds, which you just take a repeatable pattern and put it on this whole screen. This is something not very new. 
Some of you are already smiling. I'm not quite sure whether this is because I'm taking it from GeoCities. Who knows GeoCities? <laughs> All right, I'm talking to the right crowd. Yeah, it's been around for a while. Taking an, an, an tile image and fill on the screen. So I'm putting in not to poke at GeoCity, but to tell you that there is no reason for us to be afraid of so many Android devices. All of these techniques have been out there for a long time. It's not rocket science. And Android actually takes a lot of these concepts from the web and use it in the system. Um, but it also improves it a little bit. So here, this is the syntax for doing tile background. I'm just telling Android that go ahead and load this tile.png file from the drawable folder and repeat it over the screen. And when I'm going to use this tiling background, all I'm going to do is just tell Android that, hey, load this from the drawable folder, which it says drawable, that's how it matches, and then I'm calling the background one, which is know that it's an XML, and then it will go ahead and use the logic and lay it on screen declaratively. So I mentioned a little bit that it actually improves over what we have on the web. So we have actually not just a repeat kind of tiling, we have three different tiling modes. The first one is clamp, which is a little bit strange to use for a background. It repeats the edge color. And this is mostly used for things that pertains to, for example, if you're taking a text view and you want to put something on that's a little bit declarative and then you just want to have a solid background for the rest of your text. But what I really like is mirror. So mirror, it says repeats with alternating mirror images. Um, essentially, what happens is if you take this tile, which is the little triangle on the corner, and then you go ahead and flip it when you're upon an edge. Whenever you see an edge, you're always mirroring. This has the automatic nice effect that is seamless, right? If you look at the repeat on the uh, second row, you can clearly see the, the, the boundaries between the tiles. And Sure, you know, like when you go to the GeoCity website, you can download seamless tiles. But as a developer, I have no idea how to generate seamless tiles. And I actually was working with a developer on my monkey, uh, from, uh, with a designer on my monkey right app, and he made me this beautiful wood grain background. And I was trying to explain to him that I will have multiple devices with multiple resolutions, and I will need the background to be tileable. Can you cut it in a way so that it's seamlessly tileable? And he's like. No, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, no, you know, like, and I try to show him examples, and he's just like not getting it. And finally, I discovered this mode. I'm like, all right, that's OK. I'm just going to cut it myself and then use mirror mode so that it will be seamless. Um, so I really like this particular little trick. And here is another. It's almost like a tiling algorithm as well. But what I'm showing you here is a screen on my app that shows Essentially, the list of characters you can practice on this app. And you're like, OK, so what? You have a grid view. You shows a bunch of icons. The thing is, when you're thinking about this, this is on a 10-inch tablet, right? So what if I'm running on a phone? Do I still display four characters per row? Then what will happen? They will become teeny tiny, right? So what we are doing here instead is using this particular Android construct for the grid view called AutoFit. Instead of telling it, hey, it's always 120 pixels, or better, 120 dps, I'm telling Android that, well, actually, sorry, I got it backwards. Instead of telling Android it's always four columns, I'm telling Android that I want each of my character to be 120 dp, and then go ahead and work out how big the screen is. Or in my case, I'm actually not taking the full screen, so how big my parent is, and just you know, do your math. And there's a lot more parameters here in not just the auto fit. I'm telling it how big the character itself is, and also how much padding and spacing I'm doing. And here, I'm using this construct called at dimen. What is that? Um, so this is essentially one level of indirection. So instead of hard coding into my layout the dimensions for the padding and the spacing and the column width, I'm telling Android say that I want the padding to be this much and the spacing to be this much. So there are two advantages here. So one is, um, if you look at here, I want the horizontal spacing and the vertical spacing to be the same. So with one level of interaction, when I'm mucking with the perimeters, I don't have to make sure that you know, I type it twice to be the same. But more importantly, again, when I'm doing this um, resource folder trick, it's not just on the kind of parent level that I have this parent layout. 
If the parent layout refer to parameters that are in different folders, it will, for example, share the parent layout that didn't change, it's a grid view with multiple things in it. But when I'm on the last screen, I can go ahead and make the characters larger and further apart. So if you are dividing your layout and logic into smaller chunks like that, it's actually very powerful. You can have a layout that's shared, but then you want to do something slightly different for bigger screens or denser screens or even Japanese screens if you want to do that. The resource folder have many different parameters that you can target to. So with that, on a seven inch tablet, it will show three characters, and on a phone, it will show two characters. So I maintain the size, and the way I chose that is because um, here, if you get this teeny tiny thing on the screen, it just doesn't look very nice, right? So again, like if you haven't noticed the theme yet, a lot of these techniques are think about what you want instead of think about how many pixels you are going to put on screen. And Moving on, so that was mostly about the display layer. How do you put things on screen? Progressive means that I want to be able to enhance my app when my phone has the newer APIs, right? So why am I showing this slide again? I, will, I told you that this is all about layout. Well, actually, it is not just about layout. You can also target different parts depending on the platform you're on. So here it says V, for V11, so those are the API versions, and if you are familiar with Android, then you will immediately translate in your head that says, okay, V4 is donuts and V14 is ice cream sandwich. I mean, it doesn't matter. The bigger number is the newer OSs. And the cool thing about this is that you can go ahead and use that to load elements that are only available in newer platforms. So here, I'm giving you this example called toggle button. So before Ice Cream Sandwich, before essentially 14, we have these not so pretty thing called toggle buttons, which when you click, it will switch from on to off and with a color change. And then in Ice Cream Sandwich, there's this new UI element called Switch, which looks much nicer. And with the functionality, it's exactly the same. And they both derive from compound buttons. So the API behind it is also the same. So if you want to write an app that works on all devices, you will, but you would still like to take advantage of this new sexy switch. What you can do is that you can put this XML called um, compound button in your layout folder. So the layout without any of those different declaration um, parameters, it means the default layout. So by default, load the toggle button, which is available on all platforms. But if you are running version 14, and when you, when you do that, it's actually version 14 or above, go ahead and load the switch. And then what you can do is when you have a layout, you want to use either the toggle button or the switch, you can go ahead and just say include the compound button, right? And then you can do it multiple times, as many compound buttons uh, you have. And it, you can go ahead and do that, and the system will know oh, okay, I'm running on ice cream sandwich. I can go ahead and look at the V14 directory and low switch instead of toggle button. And the way you will use that in class in your activity most typically is that you will go ahead and do define view by ID again, but this time we'll cast it not to toggle button or to switch, but to the parent class, which is the compound button, which understand things like if it's checked or not. So here, for example, I'm saying that, oh, if the turbo button is not pressed, slow down the computer. Does that ring a bell? So when I was a kid, I had this tower computer that you, know, you can play games on, and then there's this magic button that when you press, it will turbo it and make it faster. I thought, wow, people who make computers are so smart. And yeah, later I found out that you know, that's, that's not what it's doing. What it's doing is when you are not pressing uh, the button, it just slows down. Um, it has to do, deal, do with the, the clock cycle and games like programming to the clock cycle. Anyway, so the idea is that when you have something that is available on the newer platform, you can use the resource folder trick to dynamically load the proper type. Uh, but sometimes, even that is not powerful enough. You will actually have to do some Java code. We are not afraid of Java, right? Uh, so for example, here, I'm you know, going through the Android documentation and looking for that particular function that I need, and I found it. Harass. 
uh, except that it says API level 5, which, which means that if I want it to work on API level 4 or earlier, no dice, that doesn't work. But I really want this function. I want it when the system has it. What to do? Fortunately, Android provides this class called android.os.build, which gives you the version that you're running on. Um, earlier, it's a string, but then it's just a string one, two, or three. Uh, so then they later introduce an integer so that you don't have to parse integer from a string, which everybody was doing. So what you can do is that you can detect the uh, level of the OS using the build class and then enhance your program when you have functions that are available. What do I mean? So here, what I have is I want to use this um, get memory function that I showed you earlier to know how big the, uh, the, 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 the heap size is, essentially. So what I do is this. Well, I just give it a default value so that there's some reasonable behavior if I don't have access to that particular um, function. And I'll go ahead and grab the Android version. And then if the Android version is bigger than what it supports, here it says um, eclair, which is the constant 5. Um, I'm going to diverge a little bit because I think it's very interesting. If you're thinking, wait a minute, you're telling me that you're trying to run this on an old device, and you're having this constant that is only, I mean, by definition, available for newer devices, right? How would an old device know the existence of a clear version 5 in, in the future? Um, so no worries. Actually, this is a public static final int, which means that if you're in Java, it's going to be inline. So what I see as a programmer is the nice parameter as the constant, but when it gets compiled down, it will actually be just the constant 5. So older versions understand numbers, so they will see it's 5. And if it's not bigger than 5, it's going to go ahead and skip this block. But if you're running on newer version, then you can go ahead and use the get memory class function. Now here I have a level of indirection, and that's because the way that older Android was implemented is it will try to resolve all the function pointers, essentially, right? So if I go ahead and call this, well, call, and put this get memory class function, even if it's protected by the if block, the VM will be like, oh, well, well, where is this memory class defined? I don't know. Blow up, right? But fortunately, Java is also very lazy. So if I put it in a uh, static class helper, essentially, what Java does is that, OK, um, there is this thing that I need to do, which this class knows. And I will just let the runtime resolve that at runtime. So it knows the existence of this class, but doesn't know the guts of the class. It didn't know that secretly this class contains things that it doesn't understand. But at runtime, it never actually go through this block, so we are all safe. Um, you actually only need to do this trick for really, really old devices. Uh, since uh, version 5 and above, the, the Dalvik VM is actually smarter. It's, it, it doesn't go ahead and try to resolve everything in advance. So I'm just showing you this technique in case you're stuck with really, really, really old things that you need to support. Right, so again, this is the formula for doing progressive enhancement. You very important to have a default behavior, right? So that you're not just having uninitialized values when the function that you want to use is not available. So you have a default value, and then you try to detect the version that you're running on, and then when you have a system that is newer than the API that you'll be using, you can go ahead and call it. Um, there is also one other thing that you can do besides saying that, all right, old stuff, you're stuck. I'm not going to have this nice functionality. And new devices, hurrah, I have new functionality for you. You can also just ship whatever functionality you need. And the concept of support library is essentially taking components that Android roll out for newer OSs, bundle it into a library, and then you package it into your app and then ship it out. Um, there's the official support library, which has a lot of different things in it. Um, so some of them are not really UI elements, like an LLU cache. Some of it, like the drawer layout, is the thing that you can slide out from the side. Um, so the idea is that even though you are running older devices, if you just package whatever new functionality you need, 
well, then your net app knows how to do it. So besides the official support library, there are also, Android is a very, has a very thriving um, open source community that has put out a lot of nice libraries here. Um, these are just a few examples. And I'm going to show you one that I was using in my app. So uh, I, there was a lot of hands up, so maybe you know this already. So there is this thing that you can use to do multi-pane UI that is called View Pager, which is in the support library, which is great. But it's very hard to tell the user that you can swipe. It's just one image on screen. So the view page indicator are these little circles in the bottom, which is done by a programmer that is um, just open sourcing it. And now you have these little circles that will hint the uh, user. And this looks exactly the same whether I'm running on Jelly Bean or Gingerbread, because I am shipping this UI element within the app. All right. so. I've told you a lot of different things. I told you how to do responsive layout with, first of all, a mindset. You have to think declaratively instead of in absolute coordinate. Once you are there, there are a lot of tools that the system has to help you with it. So you can declare things with DPs, with density independent pixels, and you can use the resource folder so that you can have different layout for different configurations of devices. And also, you can have things like a XML drawable, which again, allows you to declaratively declare images, which I think is pretty cool. And then I also show you how to have progressive functionality, again, meaning that if you have some shiny new function that you want to call, but you are also needing to support old devices, what do you do? Resource folder, again, if you ha can't tell yet, this is one of my favorite tricks to do, um, to deal with all these devices out there. You can use the version construct to uh, ask the system to load particular resources when you're running on a new system. You can also do the version track, which is the android.os.build class. So you can compare your, the running version with the version that your library is available and then only do it when it's there. And finally, you can have support libraries so that you just ship functionalities that is lacking. And with that is the end of this talk, but I have given two other talks that is also on Android, which goes into two different directions. The fluid Android layout talk goes a little bit even deeper, like more examples of what I did with my app that supports both the phone and the device. Um, then the beautiful Android talk goes into more details about doing more things like the declarative layout for the gradient, for example. So I have techniques like if you want to put gradient on text, how would you do that? And if you're interested, you can go ahead and there are the slides, the, the points of slides that have a little YouTube video and, uh, attached on the corner so you can actually watch me speak as well. And uh, if you have more questions and just want to know more about Android, this is where you find me on the internet. Thank you.